Hello everybody, I'm Matt Anderson and welcome to The Road Not Taken, how ordinary people get out of their own way and you can too. I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Mike Maddock, who is the CEO and founding partner of Maddock Douglas. He considers himself an entrepreneurial anthropologist whose purpose is to, quote, inspire and empower curiosity. He gives leaders the confidence to take action by providing the inspiration, tools and connections they need. He's an entrepreneur, keynote speaker, writer and idea monkey who's launched six successful businesses, also co-chairs the Gathering of Titans Entrepreneurial Conclave at MIT. He's the past chapter chairman of Entrepreneurs' Organization EO and YPO, Young President's Organization, both located in Chicago. Author of four books, including his most recent one, which I've got right here for those of you watching this on YouTube, Plan D, uh, co-titled How to Dream, Drive and Deliver Lessons from the World's Most Successful Disruptors. It's an absolutely outstanding book. I've read most of it. Um, and then in addition to that, Mike also is a regular columnist for Forbes. So, uh, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Man, it's a real pleasure. Thanks yeah. for the great introduction. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, I like to start off with one sort of, you know, um, standard question that I ask everyone because the focus, you know, for these conversations is really basically framed on the, on the, on the premise that, you know, too many people don't advance anything like as much as they could in life. And so this is for people, I mean, I guess A-types and specifically in sales and business leaders who just aren't, you know, raising their game consistently enough. So anyway, my, f my first and only pre-prepared question will be, you know, if you had to pick one thing that you think business leaders, business owners could do to get out of their, their own way more effectively, what, do, what do, would you say that is? You know, I just gave my first TED Talk yesterday morning and the topic that I chose was uh, how to find a soulmate in life and in business. And I think that in business, from what I've seen, the most uh, successful, happy, extraordinary business leaders, whether intentionally or by um, serendipitously, early on find a soulmate. And I started the TED Talk by saying, I'm going to give you the presentation I wish I'd heard when I was 23. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got very, very lucky finding um a soulmate at home, um, and that was because my parents modeled. Uh, you know, they 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 made themselves better better versions of themselves. They they were aligned in terms of values. But I think the mistake most business people make is they look for people like themselves to do business with, and that's a mistake. It's you're actually looking for the yin for your yang, your your polar opposite in terms of skill set, and it rarely happens. And that in my mind, uh, causes all kinds of trouble down the road. So uh, it's interesting because in the book, there's, there's quite a lot of pragmatic suggestions you have around using the Colby to score and recognizing, are you an ideas monkey? In other words, someone that comes up with great ideas on a regular basis, which is, as you also indicate in the book, the demise of many entrepreneurs. That's that, right. That, you know, they, they need that, that partner. So what are some strategies that people can use since you said it rarely happens? How can people be more proactive about finding that soulmate yeah just to, just to get the the language so that everyone understands I, the last uh, I wrote a book called free the idea monkey to focus on what matters most and I use the the terms idea monkey and ringleader to describe visionaries and operators and what happens is most companies are started by entrepreneurial visionaries they have an idea they like an idea trying to fix a problem and off to the races eventually operators are the ones that scale companies so if you can start if you can start a company with both a great visionary and a great operator that really truly respect the 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 talents of the other and actually lean into them you know it's the great thing is that i get to work on my strengths not my weaknesses um you're you're it's it's good stuff it, it, it it's just a great match so you mentioned colby thank you for reading the book mm -hmm. um colby score is a you can do an online score and find out uh, based on your score whether you're where you are in the continuum. If you're a quick start, you're an idea monkey. If you're a high follow through and fact finder, you're likely a ringleader. That's one way. Um, another way is uh, early days, uh, I sent a questionnaire to 20 of my friends that um, asked questions like, you know, what's my blind spot? Mm. What's my greatest strength and weakness? Actually, my, my work wife, Stephanie, mm -hmm. Is the result of that questionnaire, I actually sent it uh, to a recruiter who was one of my good friends, and I said, "Find my opposite." You know, I, I don't need another person like me. I need someone that loves doing the things I hate to do, and we are exactly the opposite on the Colby score. Ironically, some 15 years later, we took it, and 
that's what he did. So there's a couple of practical ways to go about it. That's really practical. So the questionnaire to people that know you well, and then to go out and seek that person. Now, objections that I could see hearing from people listening might be things like, well, I, you know, I can't afford to take on a 50-50 partner, um, or I can't even afford, or I don't, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I, they, whatever, they're reluctant to outsource even the hiring part. And, and the other thought that comes into my mind as an objection is just the number of sort of do-it-yourselfers that, that sort of exist in our culture that sort of feel like they can kind of, I don't know, figure it out on their own or almost disregard a score. But I'm throwing probably too many things at you. Um, I don't know. How can people get past the, the financial piece to kind of splitting a business if they're used to running it on their own? I'll, get, I'll give you a couple of financial data points <laughs> that should help. Uh, the day after Elon Musk's CFO fire, or I say resigned, uh, retired, he said he retired for the third time, uh, Tesla lost $1.3 billion in market cap. So that's what happens when the market sees you've lost your soulmate. Um, the yin for his yang, because there's no question that Elon Musk is an unbelievable visionary. When Jack Welsh left General Electric, Thomas Edison's company, mm-hmm. uh, he'd done such a good job building an, you know, a company that knew how to operate and eliminate risk that uh, he left when the company was at $450 billion in market share. Within 20 years, it was at $200 billion. Uh, I know that because I, was, uh, I worked for GE as, um, to help them you know, shore up their innovation function. So... The, the, the short answer is you can't afford not to do it. You, you will waste uh, thousands of hours and millions of dollars if you're anything like me, because I have. I mean, I have a very similar track record to Jack Welsh, unfortunately. Um, you know, and Jack Welsh is an incredible business person, so don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. But, but what the point is that the, at some point they got, they got sideways and out of balance, and, and I had the same uh, – experience just in the opposite way so you will be much more productive if you're working on things you love versus what you're not good at Uh, the way i would if i was starting a business i would just say okay let's start together and share the risk and share the upside together um it doesn't have to be about paying somebody it could be about sharing upside a good operator if you're an idea monkey is going to like that because there's math Hmm. and you you can work formulas a uh, good idea monkey is easy to convince in terms of vision uh, that, that with a, gr- a good operating partner that, that takes care of all the details, things will go better. So, again, don't laugh at my next question, but uh, I did strategic coach for a couple of years with uh, Dan Sullivan's program. And the first thing they have you do is take the Colby test. And I remember oh, really? partway into my second year, um, my quick start was only a five. And I remember being actually angry to be honest although again there's other reasons for that too it was i was kind of plateauing in my business but they kind of laughed at me at the notion that i was going to take quick action or, or that i could change and become more of a quick start if i was somehow more motivated so what i'm asking is you know can you know to what extent can somebody change their their score on the colby i mean is it set in stone forever or can you learn those skills or is that a waste of time I believe Colby is set from third grade on, which makes it a great parenting tool as well. Um, and Colby is Colby is a great way to judge how you're going to react when you're in flow or under pressure. You know, you're, it's it's who you are from a gut point of view. Um, and I don't work for Colby, so I, I'm starting to sound like a, it's starting to sound like a Colby commercial. Yeah. I would challenge. I would challenge your reaction, though. Do you remember your, what your entire score was? And regrettably, I, don't, I know I'm, my follow through was an, a nine. That was the highest. The other two, wow. I don't remember. One was low. One was about a three. And I should have looked before this, but I, I, I wasn't sure I could find it quickly. And the other one was, I think it was about a seven. Yeah. So you're that. That's an amazing score. I, I um, there are very few people that actually have a high fact finder, high follow through. Your follow through is extraordinary, and a and a relatively high quick start score. Uh, you're, I would call you a pivot thinker, I, you know, to make the point, I, I use scores like three, three, nine, three, you're a total yeah. quick start and you're just about ready, fire, aim and let's go, let's mm-hmm. go, let's go, mm-hmm. which is awesome because you can, you can, you can run 10 experiments while everyone else is thinking about running their first one. And as long as you're willing to learn, that's, that's what entrepreneurs do really well. Mm-hmm. Um, Pivot thinkers are the ones who stand between entrepreneurs and um, really hard-edged operator CFO types 
and they're the glue. They're, it's kind of the communication bridge. It's the it's what makes everything go. So uh, it's and it's rare um, from my experience to find someone like you. So I I would be really happy with that score actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I do remember briefly reading about that that pivot person because I know you said they're good at toggling between right. the different people, yeah. but that's as far as right. the extent I remember. So um, what, one thing I just I don't want to forget to ask you about, and it's more personal curiosity, but um, I noticed in terms of the beginnings of your journey, I'm curious because it's sometimes another way for people to connect to your journey in terms of obviously you've done an enormous number of incredibly impressive things in your professional career. But I noticed you you did a Bachelor's of Fine Arts at Iowa State. And, I did. And I couldn't have noticed. I mean, don't you want me to the, on the, the cheerleading <laughs> squad, which I thought was you know, funny. Um but that was where you, again, I don't know obviously anything about your background before that, but, 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 but it's safe to say that you start in a very creative world. You didn't go to business school. You weren't thinking about numbers. So what was your, like, how did you get engaged by entrepreneurship? Um, that's a great question. You know, I, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I, I, I think I'm kind of at an inflection point. Just, you know, what I've noticed is just to digress, cause that's what I do that, that, um, and I'm not the first one to notice this. It's, I'm just slow to the. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm slow to learn. I guess that every seven years in life, there's this moment in time where you say, "Huh," you know. You look back and you have these moments of, "What am I doing next? What's going on now?" Um, and at 14, I got my first job. I mm-hmm. I was. It was sports or work. It was. Am I going to do something? Um, physical or am I going to do something mental and I didn't grow up with in a family with a ton of money and I wanted I liked the freedom that money gave me so I wiggled my way into my first job and it was with an entrepreneur and then my second job was at 15 with another entrepreneur and just by chance everyone that I worked for and I always had at least two jobs was with entrepreneurs uh, and along the way, I was doing my own little things, you know, to make more money. It was really about freedom. Mm-hmm. And so I got a chance to look up close at what entrepreneurship looked like. And it was really messy. And it it and it was um, really hard, but it was high risk, high reward in my estimation. And importantly, um, it, it was an everyman sport it 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 didn't i didn't see a real high connection between education and entrepreneurial success which gave me hope Mm -hmm. because i wasn't much of a student Hmm. that's amazing (laughs) yeah Hmm. yeah and and just as far as arts i was a doodler i talked a lot i still do clearly um and i I, you know i was artistic and so I, i i figured it was something i could be good at and so i went that route and then I went to business. I went to Northwestern after right. Iowa State. Yeah, but, right. But, right. Uh, you know, Iowa State, one of the best schools in the world. Just mm-hmm. saying. Go Cyclones. <laughs> so, in a way, this is none of my business, but the, 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 the drive that you, I mean, clearly showed. I mean, that's not typical drive for a teenager to have two jobs and work for entrepreneurs. And you said, you, you know, you, you alluded to the fact there wasn't a lot of money in the family. Was that a significant driver or do you think your drive came from something else? Oh, uh, gosh, it's, you're asking, you're going deep. Um, yeah, my dad's a really hard worker. I saw, I saw my dad work really hard. Uh, and I, and no, it was, it was, I think it was as simple as freedom. You know, I, I having a couple, a little bit of change in my pocket allowed me to do more stuff. I, um, and then, and what's interesting is I, I, I've, I've never been about money. It's always been about freedom. It's been about choice. I, I think that success is being able to do what you want when you want. That's it. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm and really I, I now am fortunate to have friends in uh, from all walks of life. I have a ton of friends that have more money than they will ever need in mm-hmm. in five lifetimes, and yet some of them are happy, some aren't. And and I've had I've watched my friends lose everything. Um, and it's freedom. It, it's it's if you are if you're healthy enough and have a, enough uh, autonomy to do what you want to do when you want to do it. You're that's that's success to me. It's interesting. What, what about the imposter syndrome? In other words, it sounds like you grew up in you know at most kind of a middle class upbringing, um, and yet you know is it, I mean the most obvious thing reading through your book is just the number of extraordinarily well known people in um, in in the world's culture that you know. 
many people would be intimidated by moving in that direction or somehow feel like, oh, I don't really belong talking to these, you know, big shots and so on. And how, could you talk through, I mean, was it a process to get more comfortable with that or actually has that not ever phased you that much? Um, all right. So two little bits of information. When I was really young, super young, my great grandmother who lived to 104 years old and, and all 104 years of her life, she played the piano. She drank whiskey, ate chocolate, did the rosary, read the Bible. I mean, that was like, she was an extraordinary woman. And whenever I got a chance to see her, she would call me over and say, ask me to sit on her lap and get real close and whisper in my ear, you're the one kid, you've got it. It's you. I've been around for a while. I know a winner when I see him. And whether she was telling me the truth or not, boy, I believed it. And, it, and it, I mean, it made a mark. I She gave me a lot of confidence. That's number one. Number two, I think there's something um, about playing to your strengths and avoiding your weaknesses. And, and I will say that my parents allowed that early. They saw that I was good at some things and not at others. And they, at some point, they gave up. They're like, just do what you want to do. If you're good at it, it'll work out. And I mm-hmm. think there's... I think our system is built around focusing on weaknesses, and it's very dangerous. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it really is. When you get to at some point, you need to master something. You're going to master it if you really like doing it, if you enjoy it. So focus on that stuff, and as soon as you can find that, the better. And finally, I took uh, our oldest son to the TED Talk yesterday, and he hung out afterwards and talked to all these. It was a YPO TED Talk, so mm-hmm. everyone in the audience ran a business. And he came away saying, man, I'm surprised how nice everyone is. Mm-hmm. And in my experience, the people that are successful, by and large, are successful because they're authentic, humble, honest, open people. And this this caricature of, you know, you're, you, you're successful, so I should be intimidated by you. I, I don't, I just never got that. Mm-hmm. I think that if you're authentic and you're like, hey, what do you, I like asking people what's going on with them and telling them what's going on with me. And I think we're just all people. So there's a long answer to a pretty good question. It's a fantastic answer, though, because (laughs) it's so much of this is around mindset. And it's I won't lie. It's definitely been a challenge for me because I grew up with very, very sour mother anyway, around people that had more money than us. And, you know, when you hear it all the time that, you know, people got rich because they just exploited other people and they're snobs and this and that. I mean, it's impossible not to get somewhat hardwired with that. So it's, um, I won't lie, some of this has been an education process for me. I also wonder, there's something earlier you said about, um, you discovered that for, you know, being an entrepreneur was an everyman sport. I don't know when you became conscious of that, but I could also see that making it easier to talk to self-made millionaires because, you know, they many of them maybe did start very humbly. In fact, that's what I'm, one of the things I've learned through this podcast is, you know, it sometimes it almost seems like it's an advantage, perhaps, oh, to yes. start totally. with a chip on the shoulder based on how society va- judges you, because there's more of a, I think there's more of a drive to say, you know, I'll show you, I'm just as smart as you are, and 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 it's ironic that many of the people with a background like mine, where it's sort of a pretty comfortable middle class upbringing, it's I mean, it's so ironic in a way. It's what everyone aspires to when they don't have that much money. But but there's it's interesting that there's a downside to that too. That it it somehow leaves things a bit a bit soft. And, yeah, having a chip on your shoulder certainly helps. Um, but it it can also it can also hold you back. So you said something that I thought was really interesting. That that um, when you get hardwired that you know, people, it was just handed to them. And, you know, that, 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 the challenges I, in the book I write about, uh, the book is about disruptors, people that blow shit up for the good of the whole, mm-hmm. whether they know it or not, they can walk into any situation and break things better. You know, they just break stuff cause they don't like it and they put it back together and it's better. Mm-hmm. And, and what I, what I found is that most of them don't know how they do it or why they do it, right. but they have these, um, common tendencies. And so the book is about, you know, the, the 10 superhero powers and air quotes of these folks, whether they know it or not. Mm-hmm. And one of that, one of them is that they're creators. They, they're not victims. So they, there's some great work. Um, Steve Carpin, uh, David Emerald wrote a book called uh, the, the Power of Ted. It's the empowerment dynamic that focuses on the drama triangle. And there are three roles in the drama triangle. There's a persecutor, a victim, um, and a rescuer. Hmm. 
And so if you think and drama, you know, there's drama when you're complaining about anything. So if your mother's complaining about a rich person and they have all this money, she's being victimized by that. Mm -hmm. She's she's saying it to you and she's putting you in that triangle. She's so you're oh, mom, there maybe they got like if depending on how you're responding, you're playing a role. And so the whole idea is to understand the role you the role you have in drama and get out of it. And the only way you can get out of it is by changing your own behavior. And the most powerful role in the creator dynamic or the empowerment dynamic is the, is the creator. And so what 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 happens is entrepreneurs, disruptors assume the role of the creator under pressure. It's kind of like they're they're like they they get very focused on the outcome they want what they need, need to do to make it happen and what stands in their way. And that's where they spend their time. That's brilliant. So, yeah. And it's, it's, so they, so you can practice that. That is a, that is something that, that, that you can learn and your kids can learn. Your team can learn. Like as soon as you hear yourself complain, you're like, wait, hold on a second. Am I being a victim here? What is the outcome I want? Hold on. What do I want to make happen? And as soon as you switch to that question and start making a list, you are a creator. And, and you're no longer swimming in it. So your first question, my second answer would be, you know, if you feel stuck, well, what's the outcome you want? Sometimes you don't know, but as soon as you can figure it out, man, you're off to the races. Well, you know, that, and that's where I might, my life experience has been different. Um, and since you've had much better outcomes than me, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. So then I came up, and that was, that's a, that's a, I need to talk about myself, I could talk about, you know, any kind of educational course, whether it's strategic coach or, you know, I came up with a, a referral system that I trained on in multiple continents for like 15, 16 years, coached, no exaggeration, over a thousand people. And it and it's very effective. And my biggest frustration, it's another reason I'm running this podcast, is just how many people didn't follow through on it. So it's interesting, you know, you, you talk about when you know an outcome, you you work towards it. But the funny thing is, is that's where we hit, many people I think hit another ceiling in terms of kind of an achievement ceiling, an income ceiling whether it's fear of success, I, you know, I think it's different things for different people, but that's one of, probably the main reason I'm having conversations like this. So a, a simple question, or to put it in one simple question, is how, once people get on the road to saying, I want to take action, how do they think bigger so that they don't get intimidated when they actually do start to get results? They then don't sort of self-sabotage and start dropping the ball and doing other things that, you know, end up keeping them small. Yeah, I think that there's a, it's a, a great question. Thank you. And, and I just, because you've said it a couple times now, I just want to make sure that you, you've said that I'm more successful or I, I've had a lot of success. I, you know what, right now I, I have the freedom to do what I want, but I can feel it slipping away. So I, I, my, you know, if you looked at my chart of whatever, however you want to measure me, mm-hmm. it's been up and down and all around. So I, I, it's, I don't, want people thinking that you know i appreciate the compliment but i would just want to keep it real there, yeah. there's a, lot, a challenge for everybody um and i'm certainly would not consider myself having the midas touch the the, the to your question i, I did, recently saw a few speakers who had had an exit and um the topic was how they did after the exit so imagine hmm. you've done it you know you've 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 built a company and you've sold it for twenty million, fifty million, a hundred million dollars. Wow, you did it, right? The, what was striking was that two out of the three speakers went into a downward spiral of depression, and the one that didn't, that the only difference—it wasn't about the money, it wasn't about the, the like the earnout, it wasn't about the—it was about having a north star, a purpose. The one that the one that had a purpose that was way bigger than the business or money or, you know, they, they were doing it for a reason that fulfilled them. They were still on purpose. This was just, a, you know, so walk in the park. They just took one step forward towards their purpose. Mm-hmm. The two that had made the mistake of not having a bigger purpose in life had wrapped so much up into something that was less tangible, money or, you know, uh, the, the adrenaline of winning every day. So I think the answer to your question is of aiming higher is making sure that what you're aiming for is a purpose, a big why, something that, you know, that what's the Mark Twain quote, the, the most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you're 
understand what you were born to do. That's the purpose. If you can figure out what you were born to do, the earlier in life, the better. Mm. Um, you won't be intimidated by little bumps in the road because you're on purpose. And forgive me if I missed this in your book, because I, I won't lie. I, with about three of your chapters, I didn't have time to read the entire thing. So I just read sort of the hacks at the end of the chapter. Um, uh, the chapter on purpose, I, I kind of skimmed it yesterday to see if there were exercises in there. But what do you think is, is a, a useful exercise to help people get more clarity about their purpose? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I, I told the story about Christina, my friend, um, Harbridge, who's amazing, and Simon Sinek, who's a, another friend um, in the purpose. Uh, you know, the, the, the hack, one hack would be to, um, to, to think really hard about when you feel in flow and when you feel strongest, when you feel most alive. Journaling is a great way to do this. If you're journaling about the best days, the best moments in your life, there are little breadcrumbs uh, to the trail of your purpose. Mm -hmm. um, think about when you've been the most successful and what you were doing, that you were probably circling or on purpose. Think about the person that, that you think is your hero. Like, who's the person you admire most in the world? Why? What do they do? What is it that they're up to that you think is so significant? There's another clue to your purpose. Um, start with, like, the, the what you're trying to get is starting with significance, not success. Like, what what would be... It, would would if someone this is kind of morbid but if you think about your eulogy mm -hmm. what do you want people to say about you i mean it isn't he he was the richest guy or she was the best manager in the world there's something else that's those are all clues to your purpose it's a real it's a very difficult question but um well, again when when people figure out that thing that they're up to it 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 it's a moment. I, I remember Simon Sinek um, challenged us with the same thing. And it, it started with that question that got me thinking about it. It took me three years to figure it out. Yeah. So, so some recent great suggestions you've just made. Certainly, anytime we complain, instead focus on creating something. And then, yeah, get much more clarity about our purpose. Because regardless of, I guess, where our businesses end up going, we'll still have a North Star to follow. Um, well, I'm, obviously, I've got to ask in terms of your purpose, because you, you talk a lot about things that you believe in at the end of the book. And it's it's actually it's a very inspiring thing to read through. Is 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 yours around curiosity? Because, I mean, it's kind of the opening line to your bio. And if it yeah. is, how come? Like, how come it's not purpose or self-discipline or hard work or drive? Like, why curiosity? Uh, well, um, my, my purpose is to inspire and empower curiosity. So I want to make you believe you can change the world and, uh, give you the tools, connections, um, mojo to do it, you know? I, so, um, and that came out of all the suggestions that I just made. I, you know, what is it that I'm up to when I'm feeling the most alive? I'm, I'm having conversations, mm -hmm. you know, making people believe they can put a dent in the universe and then going, you know, who you should talk to, talk to this guy. Have you tried this? Talk to this. So that's what every business I've started, every, um, every time I've done the best at something, I was up to that in some fashion or form. Now the words might be a little hokey, but that's the best way I can describe what, when I feel the most on purpose. And it's funny and too, you, you, and, yet you work, and, and you work with some of the biggest companies on the planet. I would have thought they'd be the hardest people to work with versus sort of small startups where it's kind of almost like a hotbed of, of innovation and ideas. And correct me if I'm wrong, because forgive me, because I haven't worked in, in the world's largest companies. But isn't that, a, is that a, or do you do that because it's more of a challenge or to talk about that? I, I Well, so I, what's interesting is um, we have worked with 25% of the Fortune 100 but in every one of those companies, there's a person that that was challenged by the future and was looking for inspiration and some ways to guide their company. And that's who we worked with. They just happened to work for a large company. So when I'm in when I'm on stage, I'm speaking directly to that person, not their company. Got it. 
And then where does futurism come into this? Because it's something else you mentioned. I, I mean, I've got to believe most people listening to this probably feel far too busy to spend a, a moment in their day wondering what their business should be doing in five years, let alone in a month. But how can we, I don't know, how can people get more fo um, thoughtful or mindful about where their industry is going? Because I just don't feel like I see that in day-to-day -day conversations. We have a really cool methodology. We call it foresight, where we're quantifying intuition. And it's um, we're, we're using um, a, 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 we're using a combination of trends, um, the smart people in your organization, workshops, and then um, some pretty slick quantitative research to, de to demonstrate how close you are um, to being right about what's going to happen two, three, five, six, and seven years from now. And um, it's a way to – so – but to your point, most companies, most large companies and small companies are so working on – so busy working on the urgent mm -hmm. that they forget about the essential. So it's the job of the CEO, in my estimation, to think about three to five years out it's the job of the CFO to keep them from thinking about too much. And so this is a tool we use to get those two together. There's a line you use in the book that I'll be honest, I don't, I don't think I really understand. And it's right. It's in it very, <laughs> I might not either. <laughs> well, it's, no, it's in the very last, actually on the last page of the book. Um, and it remind it was something I was going to share to someone who's been mentoring me. Who's got, <laughs> it's, he's got the world's largest B2B podcast. And oh, I really? Thought, huh, maybe he should read this. Cause the line says, I believe that we've moved from a B2B to a B to C to a B to me world it's, it's the next bit I didn't understand. And the most evolved companies listen closely to the customers, customers, customer. So I'm thinking, who's that? <laughs> yeah. You lost so, me there. Yeah. So, uh, that's a, so we wrote a book called flirting with the uninterested. I wrote it with Maria Ferrante Shepes, who's our president and flirting with the uninterested is, um, a way to a clever way to describe, um, people that think they're, they're, they're working in a sold, not bought category, which is like insurance. You know, mm -hmm. you have to sell it. Nobody's going to buy it unless you tell them how much they need it. Um, B to B is selling business to business. B to C is selling business to consumer. Mm -hmm. B to me is focused. What do I want? And the way the world is working is we're becoming a B to me economy soon to soon to be by the way p to p person to person so it's going to go so these smartest companies know what their customers customers customer wants it, by way of example procter and gamble who we've done a ton of work for in the past is a a b to me company even though they sell to walmart they know their consumer so well that they can predict what busy mom or busy dad is going to want to buy, how much they're going to spend for it, when they're going to want to buy it. So when they go to um, to meet with Walmart, they say, here's how many SKUs you're going to buy from us. Here's how where they're going to be faced. Here's how much they're going to cost. And here's how many you're going to move. And they can do that to the tune of $100 million of new products per quarter across dozens of brands. They're B to me. And Walmart says, yes, okay. If you're if you're not a B2Me company, Walmart says, okay, maybe we'll take one SKU, but you're gonna have to cut the price in half. So the power is in the insight. How well you know, know your consumer? I would argue that because of um, uh, AI and um, and and technologies like blockchain, that eventually you and I are gonna be selling to each other, mm -hmm. and all of those middlemen, because I know you, you know me, so we're gonna be exchanging goods real time. But that's a whole nother podcast. Yeah. But then where, what's, so what was the last thing you said? There's person to person. Okay. And that's the next, okay. And that's the next stage. All right. So from a practical standpoint though, is this something that, I don't know, at least every quarter, you know, everyone listening to this should at least take an hour or two hours, you know, every three months to ask themselves a better question about what do I think my customer's customer, customer is going to need and how many years are we talking about? Three years from now? Well, it's already happening. I, 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 so I would, I, I think you need to make sure that you're not talking to your customer. You're talking to their customer. 
you you cannot rely on your channel partner to tell you what your customer wants because their motivations are different. There, you know, you, you have to be out in front of them and know their know your customer better than they know them. I mean, you, you have to leapfrog them and keep the power is in consumer knowledge. So I yes, every quarter you should be talking to your customer's customer. So could you give you give one more example? So the customer's customer. So you gave the example of Walmart. Um, or Procter and Gamble talking to the customer of Walmart, correct? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. for someone that, let's say, because I've got quite a lot of people in my network that are financial advisors, so it's not talking to their clients, it, it's talking to their family members? or. So I'll give you an example on financial services. Um, uh, if you're, if you're a, an insurance agent, for example, you are there's a 15 trillion dollar life insurance gap right now which is to say that the insurance industry has studied it and they're they should have sold 15 trillion for the t dollars more of life insurance globally to millennials but millennials don't necessarily want to buy life insurance because they're parents didn't go to a coal mine and die 10 years ago they don't they're not thinking about death they might be thinking about things like how do i pay my college loan back but your your insurance agent doesn't care about that because they get commissioned on selling life insurance. So if you can go and talk to millennials and say, okay, we're an insurance company, hmm. what could we sell you? You, you? You're able to develop a new product or service that they care about, like insuring, you know, if I can't get a job after I get out of school, we'll, we'll cover your salary as long as you're trying and you have a certain grade point average or whatever. That's a product they could sell that that uh, millennials might want. So there's a really practical example. Another uh, example would be if you're in the engine business or the engine additives business um, and you're selling to parts and service companies or repair shops, well, guess what? Um, lawnmowers are going to be battery operated in the next couple of years. So you're, if you're just selling to parts and service shops, you're missing the opportunity to jump out in front of what can we do when there aren't any engines? Mm-hmm. The, like engines aren't being opened up like they used to be. They don't, there's, they, so the world, is, the, the, the world is changing underneath you. And, and the only way you know that is to get to your customer's customer. Okay. That's a, thank you very much. Another thing that intrigued me in the book was, was when you talked about, and I may be paraphrasing this poorly, but listening to, to haters, people that like really, really disliked what you were offering, which obviously requires kind of a thick skin, I would imagine. Um, but, but then, can you, again, can you give an example of how that is going to help us innovate? I mean, I understand the concept, I suppose, but the idea of even finding out where the haters are doesn't sound like something I want to do during my day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the phrase is embrace the hate to innovate. And so, um, so here's a, here's a practical way to think about it. If you get around a table with your team and everybody loves an idea you're about to launch, it's probably not a very good idea. And the reason is because everyone can agree on it. You need something that people go, that's, oh my, we could go out of business. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Because if there's an emotional reaction, even if it's laughter, there's something there that is compelling. And so the worst way to come up with a, a new idea is to get some by committee when everyone's like, okay, now I would get behind that because that means you sh- you've sanded away all the rough edges that would have gotten a reaction in the world. So if you flip that logic around and say, if we're just talking to people that likes our, like our products and services, we're going to get blindsided by someone who comes in and talks to the people that hate what we're up to. That's how you get disrupted. Um, you know, the Napster was started by a 16 year old kid Mm -hmm. that was just trying to organize his music differently. And so the, the, the industry, a a quote from the the CEO of the second largest record label, when asked why 87% of his stores had closed record stores, he said, we just need greater hits. He was talking to lovers, not haters. If he'd gone out and said, well, what do you hate about records? I hate that I have to buy an album when I just want one song. Hmm. I hate that I can't call. They had, they had licensing. They had, they, they had everything um, in order to, to disrupt their industry, but they didn't talk to people that hated them. Hmm. That's a good and, Love it. Yeah, and there, there are hundreds of examples. So if you take a step back and say, what sucks about our service? What really sucks? What do people hate? It, 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 it protects you from your blind side, the, disrupted, the disruption. 
And I know it doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, honey, I'm going to talk about our relationship. How am I the worst husband ever? <laughs> I wouldn't get to work on time. Um, so, um, yeah, I'd love to talk more about that, but there's some, I know we have, don't have tons of time, and there's one or two things I really, really, really want to ask you about. I want to talk, ask you about the ghost, because it's one of your early chapters. It's, you're saying there's this sort of darker shadow that every great disruptor has, and I would I would assume every human being, in fact, I'm, I'm quite sure almost everyone you know, human has it if they're, they're pushed to certain extremes, but... You know, or even for you to talk about your actually, also if you talk about your grand, let's start with the ghost. Talk, explain to the listeners what what that is and how it gets in people's way. Okay, so um, I have never met an incredibly successful person that wasn't either chasing a ghost or being chased by one. The question is, which is it? And this is a, a different way to talk about the chip on your shoulder that you were talking about earlier. There is something that drives successful people to work harder, work longer, um, you know, just hang in there a little bit longer. And, and it, it's, it's, I call it the ghost. And what, the way it manifests itself is um, really can be very productive or very scary. And in the book, I won't give it away, but I, I outlined the scariest thing that can happen. And I saw it happen uh, to a friend of mine that was unbelievably successful. We're, we're watching, I would argue we're watching it right now in politics where um, you, what, you get these very, these leaders that are quite um, successful on some measure, but very dysfunctional on others because they have this chip on their shoulder that, that they're not even aware of. Now, then you have these leaders who understand, you know, maybe it's, um, there's a great, there's a great moment in time where Jimmy Fallon was at the presidential course, but correspondence dinner um and he was with barack obama next to him and he said uh i, I want to give a shout out to mr mills my seventh grade english teacher who said it never amount to anything well mr mills i'm about to high five the president of the united states to which he turns to his right and the president looks at him like okay stands <laughs> up the secret service is freaking out yeah. and he just high fives him and then he turns back to the camera and says suck it mills <laughs> So his, his teacher became his ghost. He, you could see that that was a moment and that guy has worked harder and, and done more because he had this chip on his shoulder, but, but what he revealed was he knew about it. He was aware of it and, and the best leaders become conscious of this ghost and they literally compete with it. And importantly, they're grateful for their ghost. They're like, yeah, this is a good thing. I, you know, I know I got it, and I'm, it drives me, and it makes me a better person. The leaders that don't understand that, or they have never thought about it, we're looking at divorce. We're looking at bullies. Mm-hmm. We're looking at manic behavior. We're looking at, uh, you know, people that drink and part like all the things that you see in these crazy type A people, who, um, who don't understand what's driving them. That's what that chapter is about. So, and thank you for that. And by the way, for everyone listening, you, well, you'd be crazy not to get the book, but there's a fantastically, fantastically useful exercise on the ghost in the book. And uh, I must admit, I, I had a real epiphany when doing it myself. So I'd, I'd highly, highly recommend checking that out. Um, so a couple of days ago, Mike, I interviewed a guy who advises billionaires. He works for a sort of a family office management company. So he gets to give them all this kind of advice about how they should run their family office and I asked him sort of about common denominators of billionaires and in his opinion and I guess just one person's opinion but they've got over 30 clients he said that the only one that they have in common is is that they all made a tremendous personal sacrifice whether it was with uh, sleep or relationships or vacation time or something and I want to ask you about that in in terms of the um, amazing and incredibly inspiring Jack Daly that you write about in your book and where you list out his goals. I mean, talk about a role model. I think that's incredible. Um, yeah. So, but again, so for, again, those listening, it's just somebody that, that Mike knows who kind of has his own board of directors, but it's around his personal goals and maybe his professional. I don't know. You can fill that piece in, but it's astonishing how meticulous it is in terms of holidays, exercise. I mean, it's unbelievable uh, and how amazing it is. And he has an incredible business. So, can you talk about the dichotomy there of sacrifice, and maybe we're talking about two extremes and billionaires, but but either way, sacrifice to become extremely um, top of your field 
versus, I guess, you know, a more balanced, enjoyable, happy life, the way you define, you know, use Richard Branson's definition of success as, as around happiness. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that there's such thing as balance. Um, I think that people, everyone's out of balance one way or another, but just again, about awareness and what you're choosing to do. Jack is strategically selfish. He and and leaders that I know that are very successful, you know, it, you misread it. You you see them playing 25 rounds of golf or 100 rounds of golf. You're like, what the 100 rounds of golf? Or they're training for a marathon or they're triathletes. And oh, that must take a lot of time. Spend much time with your kids. And I found myself judging these people because they, you know, they just seem to always be doing something that was indulgent. And what I noticed was that they were doing it on purpose and it gave them that they were like putting your own oxygen mask on first. They were, it's take care of me first, me second, me third, me fourth. Then I can take care of my business and my family. Um, I would argue that most, most leaders aren't selfish enough and they run themselves down. I, I'm not a billionaire. Um, the billionaires that I have been around all work super hard. I, I've never met a lazy billionaire, um, or maybe I have, and I didn't know they were a billionaire. But I, mm. the ones that I know have have, whether it's generational wealth or not, they they just work their butts off. So um, I think I think that surrounding yourself with a group of people that will tell you the truth about your life is critically important, um, and the successful people I know do that as well. Hmm. So they have, they have people around them that will call them on their bullshit. Um, and, um, uh, and they'll take it, they'll listen to it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I answered your question. I don't consider myself a, an expert on billionaires. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> nor will just, I ever be. <laughs> I just wanted to bring up the topic of sacrifice. Um, and, and sort of balance or not, not balancing it, but sacrifice compared to, you know, a comment you make in the book about that you, you've seen many or you've met many people along the way that do have extremely success or, um, you know, fulfilling personal lives as well as great businesses. And, uh, you know, that was the message, obviously, we all want to believe. Um, so just was curious for your take on it. Um, so just a couple quick questions before we wrap up. So I don't know if you're familiar with a, a writer called Gay Hendricks. He wrote a book called The Big Leap. And I read it several times last year. And his basic premise is, is that most people in life don't take a bigger leap from where they spend much of their life. In other words, they kind of get where they're expected to in life and stay there. And they don't take a bigger leap, even though they want to, because they're afraid that if they actually really do what they'd most love, they'll fail and it will be too painful to live with that going to their grave. W what do you say to that? I, I say I totally agree. I think that um, we regret what we didn't try rather than what we did. And I think, um, but what holds us from doing that is the fear of embarrassment, failure, et cetera. I also think, my, speaking personally, that I'm very nostalgic about um, the past and looking backwards doesn't get you anywhere. And I've been thinking a lot about this lately, but I think a lot of things that, that hold us back is, you know, what what we've been doing in the last five, 10 years and, and, and the people we've been doing it with and letting them down. And but, so that there are a lot of tentacles. We get tethered to the past with our hearts and heads and it keeps us from looking forward. But there's really nothing but what's in front of us, you know? Right. And so um, there's a great quote that, well, I don't want to misquote it, but, but I, I would encourage your listeners to take the leap you won't regret taking a leap. No, thank you so much. And then I guess two last questions. One's incredibly simple, but just preceding that, since your days you know, studying fine arts at Iowa State, who would you say you've become as a person? Um, well, first of all, I did not study finance at Iowa State. I studied design. Oh, okay. <laughs> fine arts but was oh, it said fine arts. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. if I walked in the finance department they would shoot to kill <laughs> Believe me. Um, who have I become you know I when I was when I I will say this when I was at we had a wedding video taken um, so about almost three decades ago now and um, I watched the film and there was a guy that I was a friend of in in Chicago or in college who came to the wedding and he said, hey, Mike, here's something. You're such, you've got this 
authentic boyish charm about you. And I, my, my wedding advice to you is never lose the boy in you. Hmm. And that really hit me. I, at the time, I was like, what are you talking about? And over the years, I've realized that a childlike sense of wonder and curiosity is what is makes people, if you can just hold on to it. Um, I think, I, I would like to think I've become a better version of the kid I was. Hmm. No, I, I mean, I would still get detentions at St. Joseph's grade school in Homewood, Illinois. And now I'd just be more proud about it. <laughs> That's great. And then lastly, Mike, how can people follow what you're doing and keep in touch with you? So I am, um, I write for Forbes. I, my, uh, I, I have a Twitter account. I don't use it at the, at the idea monkey. Um, I, my website is, uh, maddockdouglas.com. Um, so if I can help anyone out there, you know, shoot me a note. Mike at MaddockDouglas.com. I'm happy to help you if I can. Brilliant. Thank you, Mike. This has been absolutely incredible. Um, thank you so much for your time and listeners. Again, most important thing is to take action on at least one thing. There'll be lots of notes on my show notes at Matt-Anderson.com, Matt-Anderson.com. And I'll, I'll wrap things up with my favorite question, which is what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? This is Matt Anderson, and this was The Road Not Taken.